Welcome back to our next video in our rescue series. Today we're taking a look at some hardware such as carabiners and pulleys and how we can integrate those into some basic rescue systems. Welcome back to the channel. We are taking a look at some hardware today. So I have a bag full of hardware here that we're gonna be going through. We're gonna work through carabiners, pulleys, and different types of hardware that can assist you in some basic rescues. We're gonna stay pretty basic today with some stuff, but hopefully you'll learn some things about different styles of carabiners and pulleys and some of the hardware components. So if you are working on buying a few items to have with you to be more prepared, you know what to actually shop for and what's gonna be beneficial. Before we get going, I do wanna give a quick shout out to Courant. Courant makes a bunch of uh, rope related gear and they make these packs, which I really like, but I purchased one of these for my personal gear. Um, I had some issues with uh, some of the zippers uh, coming off on there. Their customer service was great. They got me a new pack shipped out immediately to me. Um, no issues there, so really appreciate the customer service there. And I really like the way that these packs are set up. So let me get this opened up and we'll start out with some carabiners. All right, so we're taking a look at hardware today. Um, and we're gonna start with carabiners, but when we talk about hardware, really it is what it sounds like. It is the tools that we're using that are actually hard. Um, when we're talking about software, we're talking more like Prusix, rope, webbing, um, soft links, all that kind of stuff. But when we're talking about hardware, we're talking about our carabiners, our pulleys, our descent devices, um, any of that type of stuff, rigging plates. Um, so I've got a, variety of different types of carabiners here um, and there's a couple different things that we're going to look at we're going to look at shape we're going to look at the metal that they're made out of we're going to look at how the gate locks then we're going to look at uh, weight ratings on these as well so there's a couple different metals that these are made from most common are going to be aluminum and steel steel is pretty strong but a lot of the new carabiners uh, that they are making out of aluminum are just as strong so make sure you understand the weight rating for what you're using it for, but also know that aluminum carabiners are really nice, especially when you have a whole bunch of them that are gonna be hanging from a harness, or you have a gear bag that's gonna be loaded down with a bunch of equipment. Steel gets really heavy really quickly. So unless you're doing something crazy and you have a very specific reason you need steel, I would recommend sticking with some aluminum. You may pay a little bit more for that, but most of the time it's worth it in the long run. So all the carabiners I have here are aluminum and I have a couple different sizes which are gonna have different weight ratings. Now a couple different things to understand about weight ratings. These are rated in a couple different ways. These are rated along the spine of the carabiner which is the back of the carabiner and that's typically where we should load this carabiner. We should have a load hanging here and we should anchor it at the top and that weight should be pulled along the spine. We don't want it pulling toward the front which is putting pressure on our gate, and we don't want to side load it, which is pulling pressure across it. It is strongest in this configuration. So when you look at the weight ratings on here, it says the MBS or the minimum braking strength is 27 pulling this way. Now that 27, if you go to the end, it says kilonewtons. So a kilonewton is about 225 pounds. You can think of it as one average size rescuer with a little bit of gear on them. So 27 rescuers could hang off of this before minimum braking strength. Now we don't want to be routinely loading this with 27 kilonewtons or even half of 27 kilonewtons because that will break this down over time. But we know that braking strength is 27 kilonewtons. So we want to make sure we have a good safety margin and we're staying well underneath that. Some people will use a 10 to one rule. Some people will use a 15 to one. So for a 27 kilonewton carabiner, the 10 to one rule would say, don't load it past 2.7 kilonewtons, which is still almost three guys hanging off of this single carabiner. While the 10 to one rule is not a hard rule um, to follow, it's a good safety guideline, especially for someone that's getting into this and doesn't fully understand some of the weight ratings on the equipment. Keep that 10 to one rule, and that's a good starting point as you're starting to learn uh, what you can put on your actual devices. Next here, you'll also notice that there's a weight rating of eight kilonewtons cross-loaded. So if this carabiner were to accidentally get turned in your system and you load it, it will hold up to eight kilonewtons before it starts to fail. 
Um, so again, that's 0.8 kilonewtons or less than one person if we are keeping that 10 to one safety ratio. So that's another reason to make sure that we always have our carabiners oriented the correct way. It's much safer that way. Then the last one here, you'll notice it has what looks like a G or a carabiner with the gate open, and that's what it's supposed to simulate. So there's a little pictogram on here that looks like this, and it says seven. So if we load it along the spine, but this gate does not fully close, but we're loading it the correct way, we only have seven kilonewtons. And the reason is this will start to bend and it will pull and we don't have the structural integrity of this gate that has locked in place to help hold that side. So we lose a lot of strength that way. So we always wanna make sure that these are closed, locked and secure before we load our system. So the braking strength goes up significantly from whether it's cross loaded the wrong way or our gate is open to actually having the gate closed, locked, and loading this along the spine on our proper axis so that we get the full strength out of this carabiner. So understanding your equipment, the weight ratings on it, and how to properly use that equipment is gonna be the difference in whether or not you can use this equipment safely and whether or not it will fail while you're using it. While we're talking about weight ratings, let's talk about certifications. There's a lot of different certifying bodies that will certify these carabiners and say, yes, they meet a standard, they're strong enough for a particular task, and we now put our stamp of approval on this equipment. This is a Petzl carabiner. It's very common in rope rescue, in uh, industrial access. Um, a lot of different industries use Petzl, common, common item, but it is a European company. So some of their equipment does not have an NFPA stamp on it. NFPA is a National Fire Protection Association. That's more of an American stamp of approval that we put on here. This particular one does. This is NFPA T rated. We don't have to get into all the ratings, but basically this is for a technician, someone that understands it's not very strong one way, but it is strong the other way. And you can do those calculations and use it safely. They recommend, NFPA recommends using this in those applications. They also have a G, which is a general use for people that are not as technical, that are not doing load calculations. They're much bigger, bulkier carabiners. They're more expensive. You can throw it in a system, and if you don't get your safety ratios quite right, you're still not gonna risk failure because they are so much bigger and heavier duty than the technical use ones. So just understand these have different certifications and make sure it fits with whatever you are doing. If you're a first responder, you may need NFPA certifications for your department um, to stay within guidelines. If you're a civilian that wants to be prepared, make sure that you have a good safety margin in there and buy some equipment that fits what you are planning to do with it. Um, so UL, EN, ANSI, NFPA, those are just some different accrediting bodies that will take a look at hardware, put their stamp of approval on here, and you'll see that all along these carabiners. So let's talk for a minute about the different shapes of carabiners. We have several different types. Um, and several different shapes. You have oval ones, you have this Petzl, uh, which is a D-shaped carabiner, and they call this one the AMD because of the shape of it. Um, but you can get these in different configurations depending on what you want it for. So my go-to carabiner is the uh, D-style or D-shaped carabiner. If you're gonna be doing rappelling without hardware, so you're not using a rappel device, you tie a munner hitch, clip in with a carabiner to a harness and rappel, it's a very minimalistic way to repel and gain access, but that rope will get bunched up in a D-shaped. So you want something that's wider at the top. It's generally recommended to use a HMS carabiner, which is much wider at the top, so you can fit that rope through there. Um, so it actually plays out and you can repel much smoother with that. So a basic oval style or even the D-style carabiner is one of the most common ones for most of what you're gonna use. If you're have a chance of repelling with a munner, you may want to consider like an HMS or something with a wider top to it. All right, so let's take a look at some of the gate options we have on carabiners. So this is a locking gate. When I try to open it, it won't open until I do a couple maneuvers and then I can get it open. This is a non-locking, so I can simply open it. Now a disadvantage to a non-locking is it's not gonna be as strong. The weight ratings for the braking strength are not typically as high on these because it's not as secure as a locking carabiner. Another disadvantage is if you bump this just right, you can actually open up your gate, which one decreases the strength 
of the overall carabiner and two, allows for something to be able to slip out of there so it's not near as secure. So unless you have a very specific use case for a non-locking carabiner, such as this one that came off a quick draw for rock climbing, it would behoove you to get one with a lock on it. So once you clip it on, you know it's locked and it's not gonna come off. If you do need something to be able to quickly clip in and it's not gonna be a life safety line, these come in handy for clipping gear to a harness or for rock climbers when they need a quick draw so they can hang this and simply pop a rope in there very quickly. But if you're gonna be using a carabiner in a rescue situation, which is kind of what we're talking about today, we want something that can lock in so no matter how this gets jolted or jarred, we don't end up losing whatever it was we clipped into. Now, there are a couple different styles. We have a screw lock. So this can be operated as a non-locking. I screw this with a thumb screw and I can lock it into place and it's locked. I can also unscrew it, open it up, and now it's a non-locking carabiner. So I can clip this into something, lock it into place, and I know it's locked and secure, but if I don't need it to lock, I can simply keep it open and use it as a non-locking. So there are some uses for this. But the problem is, if you want to use it as a locking carabiner, you have to remember to lock it. It doesn't automatically lock every time. So that's where these auto-locking carabiners come into play. Now an auto-locking can auto-lock, but then you have to do some movement to get it back open. If that movement is really simple, then there's a chance a rope rubbing up against this could accidentally open it and have that gate come open. The harder it is to open, the more secure it's gonna be against rubbing on edges or a rope and having that gate accidentally come open. So this is a tri-lock, which means you have to do three movements to get this open. Up, twist, and open. There are uh, dual locks, so you just simply have to twist and open. There's some different configurations on there. Um, I like the tri-lock, and in order to open it one-handed, I will hold the carabiner in between my fifth and fourth finger, and then I'll use my first two fingers, or my finger and my thumb, to push up and twist. So I can pick up a carabiner, open it up, and I can quickly clip it. As soon as I let go, I know it's locked in place, and I don't have to remember to thread this thumb screw down to make sure it's actually locked in place. So once you get used to these, they're actually pretty quick to throw on a system, lock into place, and then you can go. So when you're purchasing a carabiner or carabiners for your kit, make sure you're buying from a reputable source. Get a name brand carabiner such as these Black Diamonds, uh, Petzl, um, Edelrid, Skylotech, uh, CMC. There's a bunch of brands out there, but make sure it is a popular brand. Don't just go on Amazon and find the cheapest ones because those are probably not rated. And even the rating, if they do have a weight rating, it was probably in-house testing. You want something that's been tested by a third party so it's an objective standard um, and you don't have a failure in your system because it was poor testing. Understand what shape you want, what material you want, whether you're gonna get a non-locking, auto-locking, or a manual lock. Um, and make sure that you are matching up your carabiner to your use case. I love these Petzl AMDs, and for 90% of what you do, it's probably my go-to preferred choice for a carabiner. Well, that concludes part one of our hardware series, where we take a look at carabiners. Hopefully you found this video helpful, and as always, stay vigilant and stay safe.